first of all thank you so much ron i i met you probably 10 months ago at this point um thanks to samir who introduced me to you and uh i feel like the one thing i remember from our first call was you were one of the few immigration lawyers who was mm-hmm. very well versed with both o1as and o1bs because almost everyone i met was working on o1a specifically and um i also remember you talking about how you know your firm is very small but you guys work on pretty high volume of cases every year so i was also pretty surprised by that um so yeah i'd love to kick things off by asking you what made you specialize in working on o1s and eb1s in the first place sure um really i mean i mean there's so many different things that factored into how i ended up doing what i'm doing today but I'll, just to focus on a few things um i i actually got a got two degrees in engineering uh and worked as an a uh, process engineer at Motorola outside of Chicago for about 6 years before I went to law school and um but for a bunch of other reasons that maybe I'll come back to I was very interested in immigration and so in law school all of my all of my summer work all of my volunteer work it was always related to immigration and um I'll skip over several details but I eventually got a job at a uh law firm connected with Ernst and Young and we were doing very high volume corporate immigration and all of a sudden it's sort of this sort of magical link between my legal interest and my process engineering background came together because when you're working in those high volume practices you really have to be good at being efficient um and probably many of you have had kind of the negative side of that experience that you know happy to hear about that it's also part of why when i finally decided to leave and start my own firm I really wanted to get back to more of a um client focused really co- almost like a concierge level of service um but trying to apply those efficiency uh standards and pro- and practices that I had learned over the years and so that's kind of how that came together and by the way the O1B part I mean we probably won't have too many people interested in that but um I brought on a lawyer who became my partner at the law firm and he's very interested in music and so um we we've been building sort of in parallel this this practice that focuses on people in technology and at the same time people that are very creative and there's there's interesting parallels between both the visa categories as well as the people who apply for them and um even though you wouldn't necessarily think about that in, immediately um there's kind of a uh, let's let's maybe call it an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit that that crosses across the technology and creative divide that um hopefully a lot of you have that as well. Yeah, I actually do think it might not be a majority but there are a minority number of people who are um more on the creative and artistic side in the community. The topic of this AMA specifically is about talking about three criteria under the O1 um visa. First is original contribution which you know in Unshackled Samir and I talk about how that is probably the most pillar that you should try to go for if you have evidence and secondly it's critical capacity or critical role and the third is awards mm-hmm. so i'd love to hear from you briefly insights on all three of them so ron why don't you kick us off with original contribution first yeah 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 great and um uh by the way my father was a professor for his whole career so i could talk endlessly and i really don't want to i'd rather answer your question so Sundaria please cut me off um but i i would say it, it's funny cuz when when you were working on the book and you asked me for some input on some of some of what had been written and um i'm really excited about original contributions because to me that's actually central to every o1 that we work on because even if you don't necessarily have um the most obvious evidence for it we have to talk about what you've done what's the impact that you've had what makes you extraordinary it's not going to be enough to just say that you got promoted very quickly at Google or Facebook or some big company the government's not going to care about that it's we have to tell them why did you get promoted quickly what was it you did that made that that got you that recognition so um that's that's where i would start with original contributions um and can you also maybe briefly talk about What are all the kinds of evidence that people can use under original contribution? Like patents is one, but can yeah. you give more examples? 
Yeah, so I mean, let's start with patents. That's kind of the classic example. It's pretty well established that that should be accepted as meeting the criteria. Um, however, um, it's not it's not necessarily enough to to have filed the patent or even have have it granted. We also need to explain how is that invention or creation being applied in practice, and the clearer that we can show that. It's being, it's it's generating revenue or creating uh, an increase of subscribers, or it's or it's reducing cycle time of something. We we really have to make that connection. Uh, we can't just say here's the patent and move on. So the evidence, um, I think, sometimes what can be challenging is that if you if you worked on a patent at company A and now you're at company B. A lot of the evidence is going to be kind of internal proprietary evidence from the previous employer, and so you know one of the themes that I always talk about is, um, you know, make sure you're keeping good records of what you're doing because even if you're not ready to apply today,、um, it's going to be much harder to go back and try to obtain some of that.、Um, obviously, we always have to be sensitive to, you know, we don't want to include something that you're not supposed to still have after you leave. I mean. The former president is a good example of what can happen if you do that,、um, but、um, but you know, like at least it'll help you remember. Like, okay, there's this. Here's here's maybe、uh, like you developed some sort of facial recognition technology that's used for I don't know. Like Facebook has this portal that kind of follows you around. Um, for doing video calls, right? So, like, maybe you worked, you patented some aspect of that. Well, maybe you're not going to be able to show us the internal, you know, revenue growth that's directly connected to it. But at least you would have a general idea of how much that, you know, led to some new product offering. And then we could go try to find、uh, news articles about it, maybe even information on Facebook's website that would say, like, show, like, here's Portal, and we can point to the specific. Technology that you worked on. I, I'm just kind of making up that example, but that's、um, you, you just. It's again, it's not going to be enough to have just the patent. We also have to show what did it result in. Yeah, and I think you know this kind of goes back to the theme I keep hearing is build a comprehensive portfolio、um, that's that's more holistic than just one component. So you know, like maybe、uh, write a post on social media talking about your work、mm-hmm. on the patent. Um, see if there's any press article that can be published. So you have a portfolio of evidence to show for each of them.、Yeah. And great. Let's go on to the second criteria, which is critical capacity or critical role.、Um, maybe could you briefly define what this means and then share insights on what counts as evidence? Yeah. So the, the, the probably the most important thing to know here is that there's two parts to it. There is proving that you had a critical role. And then there's proving that it was at an organization with a distinguished reputation, and that is probably one of the most common RFE items that I see. Is that they'll even say in the RFE like you've proven that it's a critical role, but you haven't demonstrated that the organization had a distinguished reputation. So、um, most of that really should be up to the lawyer, especially if it's a bigger company. So again, like I'll just keep with this Facebook example, we would include some sort of Um, on that second part about the distinguished reputation, we would show you know top social media apps that are being used by subscribers or by ad revenue or something. All of that should be publicly available type of data.、Um, so it's it's typically not that hard. If it's a smaller company that you worked at,、um, we we work with a lot of、um, startup founders, and so the issue would be okay. Well, maybe your company isn't a you know a household name, but You, your company was accepted into Y Combinator or some other accelerator. Well, that piece of evidence is going to go to multiple criteria in the O1 or the EB1 because it's it's we could use it to talk about membership. They probably gave you venture capital funding, which will be used toward awards, which we'll get to in a moment.、Um, but also, then we circle back around and we say that also demonstrates that your startup company. Um, had a distinguished reputation because it was recognized by one of these leading accelerators.、Um, but、uh, yeah, so kind of the same thing. It's like we look for articles about the company, some sort of ranking,、um, and we can be very niche about it too, right? Like we can be very narrow in terms of defining what made that company 
uh, so specialized. And, and just, uh, just very briefly on critical role, um, I mean, again, because we work, we work with a lot of startup founders, I don't even really think about this too much because it's, it's very easy to just say, okay, this person's the CEO without them, the company wouldn't exist. I mean, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but that's, that's that element. But if you've worked primarily at bigger companies, what we want to do is say, um, you were the senior software engineer, the lead software engineer on a particular product or project and, and get into the details of how without you leading that project, it would not have come to market. That's the, that's the kind of thing that we need to explain in the letter. Um, and that's going to have, we're going to have to obtain some sort of a uh, combination of proof of employment through like a job offer letter combined with somebody at that company who's willing to sign a letter confirming your experience. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, last week we had, or the week before we had uh, Anu Ramakrishnan, who was an AB1A recipient. And she was talking about how she got letters from VPs at her companies mm -hmm. that attested to how she played a critical role on a lot of projects because she didn't have any press articles that mentioned her name, mm -hmm. even though there were press articles around the work she did. So I think um, like in lieu of press articles, you can get these letters from people. Yeah, it's, it's always a situation where you're never, you're almost never going to address one of the criteria simply by one piece of evidence. It's almost always going to be kind of two things that are, that are backing each other up. So that letter is confirming the role and then you can point to some public article that doesn't have the, your name, but then it, 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 it confirms the project that that letter is saying that you worked on. And again, going back to sort of my opening comment, this is why original contributions are so important because you really have to map out from the beginning, what are, what are your you know, three to 10 sort of big things that you've worked on in your career? Shreya is asking, what kind of evidence can we show if you're changing career paths, for example, going from an analyst to life coaching. And this is something I do get a lot is people who switch careers who have done incredible things, but don't know how to use that currently. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question and it does come up a lot. Uh, we're working on a EB1A for somebody who was a, a user experience designer um, and then and, and was recognized in that capacity and then started companies that um, uh, basically develop technology to assist creative people um, that, that were also working in user experience. And so th basically you, you have to be able to connect the two somehow. And so what, one of the things that is um, uh, also very important at the beginning of these cases is figuring out what is your field? Um, if we try to say you're an extraordinary software engineer, you're probably going to get blown out of the water because there's millions of software engineers and trying to prove that you're one of the top software engineers is tough. So what we have to say is something more like in, the, in this example that's in the chat, we would have to say that um, something about how uh, you're an extraordinary um, leadership development, uh, extraordinary leadership development for computer professionals, something where we could, I mean, I'm, there might even be something more specialized in that, but we want to, we have to be able to connect your past with what you're doing now. Otherwise, we're not going to even be able to include that evidence, but almost always we can find a way to show how that prior experience uh, was a building block that led to where you are today. Thanks so much. I, I think it's also, I like the idea of what you just said, which is, you know, you're a leader in the computer. So Shreya was asking specifically about going from an analyst to life coaching. So I feel like, do you think it'll work if Shreya says the people that she's coaching are analysts or people in computer professionals? So there is some linkage there because of that. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, um, you know, we don't know enough about what type of coaching, but um, I would say if if we tried to say just general life coaching for everybody, that's that's probably going to be a problem. Um, and not to say that you can't be doing that, but we're going to characterize it as some. We're going to be creative. We're going to characterize that your particular coaching style uh, is somehow built upon the way. I, I don't know if you mean like computer systems analyst or management analyst, but at, either way, it's like we could also make sort of this argument that. 
the way that you went about developing systems as an analyst is how you have developed your own kind of specialized coaching model that you apply in your coaching practice. So that's, there's, there's many different ways that we could do this, but ultimately we've got to find some common thread. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, let's briefly talk about awards and then we'll get into questions in the mm -hmm. chat box. I see one more question, but I think we'll, we'll just touch upon awards before we get there. Sure. So, yeah. Um, so briefly describe what the awards criteria is about and then insights for how to build evidence. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's funny because um, that is a criterion that um, I would say the USCIS really pushes hard back on. Um, and we as lawyers then push back against them. Um, the, the, but what I would say is to some degree, as you think of any of these criteria, uh, don't get too stuck on the detail of what the regulation says or what, I mean, this is kind of what the lawyers do is sometimes we read a lot about the policy manual, but you also need to like zoom way out and just put yourself in the shoes of that adjudicator. And they're like, they're just gonna do kind of a smell test if you will. And if you're talking about you were the top math student in high school, it just doesn't pass kind of the like, well, that's not really what the government intended by extraordinary ability. So, but you could get really stuck on like parsing the language of the regulation and trying to argue over what, you know, well, actually it meets the, you know, the wording of the regulation. Um, but instead, I think you have to think about it as if you were talking to your friends or even your like nieces and nephews or kids, like how would you explain why this award recognizes you as being important in your area? Um, and so um, in the technology area, I, I will say that we, again, because we work a lot with startup companies, there's lots of competitions for like best emerging company in AI, right? All, AI is all over the place now. So there's all kinds of opportunities to be recognized for work in the tech space, especially at the smaller companies. When you're at a larger company, um, and, and again, like I'm kind of maybe drawing a lot from my own personal experience working with big law firms that were part of big accounting firms compared to now, um, it's very easy to get sort of very almost isolated in the the, the silo of that company because you're, you know, they recognize and they give internal awards to people all the time for different things. Those are great, but you really should look for opportunities to maybe present a paper somewhere um, or, or um, uh, speak at a conference. That's what I would say, even if it's an internal conference, like maybe annually Google might do some sort of annual conference for all of their, um, uh, ad, uh, revenue people, whatever they call them. Um, so look for an opportunity to speak because now we've got original contributions again. I'm going to keep coming back to that, but maybe they also give some sort of recognition for, you know, audience favorite presentation. Um, that's the kind of internal award that I, I would feel comfortable using. Um, but if it's just kind of like employee of the month sort of thing, that's going to be much harder to argue that it meets what, what the government intended by award. Um, but definitely um, uh, the, the other one, again, if anybody's in the startup world, venture capital funding is a big one that we use all the time. Yes, thanks for mentioning that. And one more note on awards that I remember is that, um, you know, with awards, it's not, you can also use evidence from showing who else has gotten the award. Mm -hmm. So if you're on the same pedestal, as someone who is a very renowned researcher or engineer or product manager, you can also point and say that, look at all the other people who've gotten it. And so I'm on the sh same stage as them. So I love this. I love this because there's both uh, good things about that, but also let's say like pitfalls, because um, what, you, what you do need to be a bit careful of is, and this also applies to when you're going out and getting expert letters, um, there's, all, there's like a fine balance between, you, you know, if you were able to get a letter from Mark Zuckerberg, let's say I keep coming back to Facebook for some reason today. Um, you know, everybody knows Mark Zuckerberg. That's great. It's going to look really impressive. But if he if that letter ends up talking more about him than what you've done, 
he's going to end up outshining you and you're no longer going to look extraordinary. So um, if you're going to uh, present evidence about how you how you are like to Sundaria's example about, you know, here are the other people who won the award. Just make sure that it that it's clear that um, those people are are both impressive, but um, the danger there also could be like if everybody's getting the award, the government could come back and say, well, that wasn't that was more like an, you know, a participation award as opposed to um, an award for being at the top of something. Thank you for calling that out. Uh, I mean, you are the expert on this. So if I say anything, that's not. No, no, no. It was it was perfect because I think. You're, you're giving everyone a, the, the right things to think about, which is like, um, who, who are you relative to other people? Because that's sort of the way the government, again, like don't get too stuck in the, the, the weeds of what the regulation says, mm. because the way these adjudicators review the applications, whether it's O1 or EB1, is they, they, I think they're allocated something like 25 minutes, including writing an RFE if they're going to issue an RFE. It's wow. something it's something ridiculous because most of our petitions are over 500 pages. So it's like we know that all they're really doing is like flipping through the pages. Um, they're making their decision about whether they're going to approve it or deny it based on probably just a few minutes. And then if they if they're not going to approve it, if they're going to issue an RFE, that's when they go back and spend more time looking more closely at the evidence. So um, if you spend too much time in the weeds, but forget about the big picture, that's, those are the cases that often get those RFEs. Yes. And the last point I'll make is none of the officers are experts in the fields that people are applying for, right? Because how can one person be an expert in everything from rocket science to music to teaching? So I feel like um, one thing that we mentioned in Unshackled as well is make sure that you talk in a way that someone who has does not have the expertise can understand. So if you get too much into the weeds, then you're losing the person. So yeah. Just wanted to call that out. And, and, and by, the, by the way, because everybody is, most everybody is involved in tech, um, you know, use, use chat GPT or BART or whatever to help you. Cause the lawyer is going to ask you like summarize what you've done. Um, tell us about your projects. Um, if you need help writing that to make it clear to the lawyer, that's also going to help the lawyer present it to the government. But we have some ethical duties that prevent us from sharing your personal information and those tools. Um, we're kind of waiting for some better technology to develop that would uh, protect your confidentiality. But um, those tools are, are really great at writing. If, if nothing else, they're really good at writing. So you can put something in and say, hey, write this better or write it in a shorter way. Um, so right. use those tools to help you. Awesome. Okay. Let's get to questions now. Um, mm -hmm. we, I have, I see a lot already. So I'll start with Rohan who asked the first question. He asked, what can we showcase as proof of scholarly articles for EB1, not mm -hmm. one. Right. And, and so, um, and just to clarify, cause I think I also saw a related question about EB1A and EB1B. So just in case you're not aware, they are two different categories. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> EB1A is extraordinary ability in a particular field. EB1B is outstanding researchers and professors. Um, I would say EB1B, uh, our, we actually don't do those I and mean, we would, but they just, for whatever reason, don't come up for us. Um, they're, they're kind of a cousin of the EB1A, but I, um, EB1B is much more focused on the research aspect, the academic aspect. Um, on the EB1A side, there is a criterion that talks about scholarly articles though. And so um, if you're more of a, um, in the, let's say the practical world, as opposed to the research world, and I hope I'm not offending anybody with that, but, um, we could still use those articles. They're great. And, and I think, uh, the question was like, um, something about how do you, let me find it. Uh, yeah. So the proof would be, um, your Google scholar printout that shows how many articles you've published, the, the different factors that show how many times it's been cited, the relevance of that article. Um, 
this is where you know if, if you if you are going for O O one sorry E B one B um, the outstanding researcher we're we're really going to want there to be a lot of articles. If you're EB one A, even if you just had a single article, but it's the article that gets referenced by everybody, um, then that's going to be the type of evidence that we want to show. So it's it's uh, how, we have to prove who's who's relying on that article. So that could be based on the statistics in Google Scholar. It might be, for example, and and this is probably not in the sort of context of most of you, but um, we did a we did a O one A for a lawyer who wrote a book during their uh, master's degree outside the U S. It was part of their master's program that they had to write a thesis. That thesis got published into a book. It was about freedom of expression, and uh, just through that person's connections, they were able to get somebody in the Supreme Court of that country to write a letter stating that that book is one of the references that they use whenever freedom of expression cases come up. Um, and this brings me to also an important point, which is that you've got to be building your network because you're going to need to call on all sorts of people to, to basically attest to what the importance of what you've done. Um, but in terms of that article, it could be former professors talking about how important that article is. Um, I often think in the government questions, the um, impartiality of those people. So um, if like your professor knows a different professor who's willing to look at your article and comment on its importance, um, that can actually have a lot more weight than your, let's say, PhD advisor who knows you really well. They're obviously going to be in your corner. Um, but that, those would be kind of a few examples of, of what we would look for for articles, scholarly articles. That's a great point about the network specifically, uh, because one theme that I noticed across people we interviewed for the book was that they had to tap into everyone that they knew of within their network, friends, friends of friends, friends of friends of friends, because yeah, it, it does take a village to put together the application. But, um, and by the way, I, just to just to plug uh, just to plug the Unshackled community. It could be that some of the people that you meet in this community end up being people who write letters for you. So get to know each other because maybe they're like, if there's a peer that's working in the same area, but at a competitor that you never knew about, that person might end up being a really good person to write an article for your application or sorry, write a letter for your application. That's a great point. And this is also why I think um, you should go check out for people watching, check out the member directory and look at the companies. You can actually filter by location and company over there. So just take a look at where all the other people are working at. And um, I know for a fact, because I have met most of you at this point, that you're all working at stellar companies. Um, there is a related question that I want to ask. Mm -hmm. So we kind of talk about the same topic right now. Nivedita is asking, what's a good way to start publishing in academia mm -hmm. if you're on H1B right now? Like, can you do that independently or do you, or should we work? Should you work through your company where you're currently employed? I mean, again, I'm just going to caveat this by saying this is not really our. There, um, there are lots of firms that that's their specialization is working with. For example, the research department at Apple, and they do lots of O1s and EB1Bs for people in the research department at those companies. Um, and one thing that I would say is that a big difference between the EB1A and the EB1B is that the EB1A can be a soft petition. The EB1B, you have to have um, an employer who serves as the petitioner. So um, if you're, I, I will say in, in the corporate context, the EB1Bs are stronger when that comp the company usually has to be big enough to have a dedicated research and development department. Um, if you're at a small company, the government's probably gonna question whether you're truly focused on research and development. But coming back to that question, um, uh, it's I, I think there's an aspect of it that maybe is uh, the subtext here, which is if you're on H1B, is it violating your status to be publishing an article? Um, it's interesting because I don't think there's any formal guidance on that other than the fact that if you're not being compensated for it, um, then it should be fine. Um, there shouldn't really be any reason that you couldn't in your own time research something and write an article about it. Of course, if you're 
you have to be careful too if you, you don't want to violate your employment agreement with your employer. So whatever you're talking about in your research paper, you can't be citing to things that would that would violate the uh, you know the confidentiality NDA, whatever you have with your employer. I think that's where the challenge can be. <clears throat> but if you if you wanted to conduct some independent research in your free time, um, you know just in terms of how you get it published, it's probably just a matter of building your network of professors, either that you already had or asking them if they could introduce you to people, um, maybe even like do some, you know, get the LinkedIn premium and do some advanced searching and try to find professors that work in that area who might be interested in your article. You might need to see if they might want to be a co-author potentially that that's okay. Um, those are just a few ideas. Right. So your point is you can publish independent academia articles as long as you're not using confidential information from your work um, or that it's paid. Like yes. you cannot get paid for it. That becomes right. work. Right. Um, next, I'll ask Shravan's question, which is around awards. So Shravan is asking what evidence could be provided for an award that is from a niche competition at an international conference? So I'm assuming Shravan, for example, maybe he's going to present at an international conference. So um, what can you use as evidence for a very niche competition from mm -hmm. there? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And I'm sure like I, I probably would need to dig more into the, the details of it. But, but what we would be trying to establish is that that particular competition is... Um, the go-to competition for that particular area. Um, maybe it's such a, as you say, maybe it's such a small area or niche area that it's not big enough to have its own dedicated conference or association that, that awards memberships and things like that. But if this, you know, panel or, or um, competition within a broader uh, conference is the only one or one of the only ones that exists. That's the kind of thing that we would try to argue. It's going to be hard, but um, it's probably going to be a, com a combination of like, here's the here's the program of the conference showing all the different things that happened, you know, identifying the competition combined probably with some expert letters confirming uh, their 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 ability to comment as an expert on that field. Maybe it's a professor or a very high level person at a company in that area who can say, you know, this is the, we always go to this competition to look for rising talent. Um, actually, I'll take that back because you have to be careful about the word rising because the USCIS will zero in on that word and say that you haven't yet achieved being at the top if you're rising. Um, some of these little, uh, Often it's that one word that can throw off a whole case. But my point is, find somebody who can comment on the importance of that competition. I'm seeing a question that's also related to uh, publishing in academia, which is, can we work on paid research to publish academic material while working on a cap-exempt H-1B, asks Aditi. So can you get paid for working on research and publishing I guess the question is, yeah. are you authorized to do that? So I'll let you take it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, the simple answer is only if you're getting paid by the petitioner of your cap exempt H-1B. So it doesn't give you free free license to do work for anybody. That cap, it, just like any a regular H-1B, you're only authorized to work for the petitioner. You could, exactly. you could, you could have them do a concurrent H-1B, um, but they would have to file that petition for you first. Absolutely. And Aditi, if you have a follow-up question on this, please feel free to put that in chat, just so we address your exact question mm -hmm. as well. Along the same lines of getting paid, we see a question from Vic, where Vic is asking, if we want to get paid for side work, which is different from the main work, what are the pros and cons of switching from an H-1B to an O-1? I guess the question is, does the O1 give you more flexibility in getting paid for side hustles? Yeah, um, great question. Um, so there's sort of a yes and no type of answer. Um, the O1 does require a petitioner. Um, 
And this is where I would say our practice is a little bit different because because of the fact that we do a lot of OMBs for for um, artists and musicians and other creative types is that it's very common in that context to have the petitioner be an agent. That's not as common on the O1A side, only because it's just not that common that let's say a software engineer would have an agent. Normally you have a employer. Um, However, the way the regulations are written, there's nothing that would prohibit you from having somebody serve as an agent solely for the purpose of acting as an immigration, uh, as a petitioner for the O-1. Um, it, it's it's kind of a complicated area that I, I'm, I can't really give you sort of general, like, here's how you do it, ABC, but um, there might be a way to make that work. The more common way, though, is where... Um, especially if it's if it's an O1A by your own startup company or some sort of smaller consulting company, is just have all those side projects, ha- have the agreement between the petitioner and the client, and you get compensated by the petitioner. But it's it, on paper, it's the it's the O1 petitioner that is the the entity that's being hired to provide that service. It's just that you're the one delivering the service on behalf of that company. That's that's the more common way to do it. Exactly. And I remember that, for example, uh, in the book, Samir gives an example of how he worked with someone who was working as like a UX designer of sorts at this big 3D software company. And beyond her work at the company, she also wanted to publish her work at galleries and get paid for people who want to buy it. So and what Samir did was he made that part of her work at the company. And her employer was willing to take upon that responsibility. So I feel like the answer is make sure that whatever you're doing is in a creative way, a part of your work at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but by the way, I mean, this is this is the uh, the pro and the con. I think the, the beginning of the question was like O1 versus H1B pros and cons. Um, one of the one of the you know, pro is that O1 doesn't have a six year limit. Con is that it doesn't have, a for, there's no formal dual intent. So you do have to be aware, especially about international travel when you get to the AOS stage, um, the, the final stage of the green card process. Um, also spouse of O1 would never be eligible for work authorization until they get either the, the green card based um, EAD or green card itself. Um, Whereas H4 could get an H4 EAD if you're in a if you're in a retrogress category and your employer has an approved I140 for you. Um, uh, the other thing that I was going to say, just apart from the immigration side of things, is that if you work for your for a startup, whether it's your own or somebody else's or some sort of smaller company, uh, you know those companies don't always survive. So. Um, you 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 could be on the back in the job market sooner than you would expect. Great. Next, I see a question from Rohan, which is around the critical role in distinguished organizations. So Rohan is asking, what would be considered evidence, which you kind of covered in the beginning of the conversation. Uh, but I think the more interesting question is, does critical role depend on your designation in the organization for an EB1A? Uh, so not necessarily. I think what you mean by designation is like job title. And I would say not necessarily. So you could be, you know, software engineer one, let's say. Um, but if you were the one who, um, you know, it, you don't necessarily have to have managed a team or had people reporting to you. But if you're the one who developed the key part of a broader program and you were charged with developing developing that code, um, that's how we would try to make that argument. And we would focus on basically what your outcomes were as opposed to the job title or the salary or something like that. But usually it's like, you know, I, I, I'm just trying to think like we, we did an EB1 where early on in the person's career, um, I mean, this will tell you, this will give you an idea of how long ago it was. They were, they were one of the people who came up with the idea for uh, subscription for online gaming um, prior to that point, it was always like you had to go buy, you know, the game uh, for your console. And and he was part of the development team at a pretty well-known uh, online gaming company who was who came up with this idea or probably was, I mean, honestly, he was probably part of the team that came up with the idea of 
subscription services. And now that's the, that's the norm in the industry. And that's a, that was a big part of the argument was that this technology that he worked on was not just critical to that company, but it became the model that was adopted across the industry. Thanks, Ron. I see more questions, very interesting questions for coming in right now. Um, before we get to that, I, I see a question from Anu from before, where Anu is asking, is there a recommendation to apply for an O1 before an EB1? And it's, it's a question that comes yeah. up a lot, which is very valid as well. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, I think last week you had somebody talk about um, EB1C, multinational managers, and it comes up a lot in that context also. Should I do an L1A first? Uh, sometimes people have an H1B or E2 uh, that comes up a lot and then they want to switch over to anyway. In this context, though, here's what I would say. Um, it, it provides some information about the likelihood of success of the EB1, uh, but it's not, it's not a very good indicator of success. Um, like if you were to do the correlation of it, it's probably not as strong of an indicator as you would like. Uh, where I would say the information is helpful is that if we put together an O1A and it and you get an RFE, um, we're really going to get into the head of the adjudicator of which were the criteria that they weren't convinced about. And that can be very helpful when we do the EB1A because now we already know that we needed to strengthen, for example, the distinguished reputation of a particular employer, or they were questioning whether an award was truly significant and then how did we respond to it that ended up leading to the O1A approval. Um, but if you were to say, oh, I have an O1A, I'm going to get the EB1A, I would say that's a really, really bad assumption to make. And, and just practically speaking, you know, approval rates of O1s are typically above 90% even during the Trump years. Um, EB1As, especially at Nebraska, have like plummeted down into like the low 60s overall. Um, and keep in mind that I think there's a pretty decent amount of vetting that immigration lawyers do that we're not usually filing really bad EB1s. There's probably some shady people out there who are, um, but 60% uh, is not very good odds considering the amount of work that goes into putting it together. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things that... Um... In Unshackle, we have like a chart of O1 versus EB1 approval rates. And you can see that they're just, you know, O1s are thrice as, or twice as, mm -hmm. or uh, have more probability of getting approved than EB1. Aditi asked a follow-up question to her earlier question around, like, can I publish academic papers, paid research academic papers, besides my, like, CAP exam to H1B? So the follow-up is, I'm on a CAP exam to H1B. And it sounds like I would need a concurrent H-1B to publish these papers and get paid. But is it okay if they're in different fields? Mm. I mean, it's okay from a like work authorization standpoint in terms of how it supports an O-1 or EB-1. It goes back to the earlier discussion. Like we've got to be able to connect the two. Just showing that you that you um, had this job at a you know Lawrence Livermore Lab or something like at a very impressive place. Um, that by itself, it has to fit into the overall context of what we're saying you're extraordinary at. And it could be like, it could be that your main research area is AI, and then you got an opportunity to work on something specifically related to, um, uh, I don't know, like video, something related to video we're, we're working with a company now that's focused on something related to video. Um, there's, there's almost always going to be a way to connect those two because why did they want to hire you in the first place? Like that's probably the question you should be asking yourself. It's, it almost always is going to be related to something you've already done. And so we just need to explain that in the petition. Um, yeah, and I actually feel like Aditi probably is, was asking just in the context of an H1 and not looking for mm -hmm. a talent visa like O1 or EB1. So I feel like the answer is, Yes, you can get a second concurrent H1B in a different field, but you still have to pass the basic like bar for getting an H1, which is that it's a specialty occupation related to your degree. All of that still matters, right? A absolutely. And it might be like maybe you maybe you have a bachelor's in engineering and your day job is as an engineer, but you also have an MBA and you're doing some management consulting on the side. I don't know how... And keep in mind, like, I mean, this is, again, not an area that we focus on, but 
if you have a cap exempt H-1B, you could do a concurrent H-1B for an employer who is cap subject without having to be selected in the lottery. So that those type of opportunities do exist where, you know, but then that, as Sundaria said, like the H-1B petition has to demonstrate that that new opportunity qualifies as a specialty occupation. Exactly. And in fact, the example you just gave, which once again, you know, um, I interviewed Daniel Goldman from Open Avenues Foundation for the book. And Open Avenue specifically does this, where they kind of help you get a cap exempt H-1B by pairing you with a university. And in the meantime, you can get a concurrent cap subject H-1B to keep working for your employer. Uh, and it's kind of a way to retain talent, especially if you don't get picked in the H-1 lottery. And uh, anyways, people can go check more about them at the foundation link I've put in the chat. Um, it does come with a cost. So understand the cost it takes to go through them as well before you start. Um, maybe we'll end with one last very interesting question from Rahul is Rahul is, wants to know, um, can I work for two separate entities? One of which, you know, gives me an H1B for a day job. And the other one is an O1 for like a startup on the side. So can I have an H1B and O1 at the same time? No, <laughs> that's yeah. No. Unfortunately, no, you cannot hold two different statuses at the same time. You can only have one status at a time but you could have two concurrent employers or even three, four, five concurrent employers within the same visa category. Awesome. That's kind of what I thought as well. And, you know, to Rahul, to your point, um, it might be easier for you to get a second H-1B, concurrent H-1B, or switch to an O-1 and make both of the work a part of your bigger employment because O-1 gives you that flexibility. And sometimes it might, there, I'm not sure if this is part of the question, but just so that everybody's aware, there are some kind of procedural things we can do if the, if the concern is about timing. Like maybe you don't want to give notice to your H-1B employer until you know that you're going to have the O-1 approved for your startup. And so, um, you know, the good and bad is that you could do what's called a uh, concert notification O-1 so that you're not changing status, but you're... You're just saying, give me the approval and then I'll take it to the consulate and get the visa. And that thing gives you the power to decide, like, when are you going to give your notice to the H-1B employer? Wait until you have the visa appointment scheduled, because that sometimes can be a challenge, as a lot of you probably know. So um, if that's the concern, there's some procedural ways to kind of manage the timing of it. Awesome. I think this was super productive. Thanks so much, Ron. Um, I were, were over time. I appreciate you staying back and answering all the questions. And do you have any call to action? Like how can people reach out to you if they have more questions? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I'm going to be at the launch party next month. So hopefully I'll see a lot of you there. Um, I've, I've been talking a lot with Sundaria about ways to come up with some sort of model of like a self-service driven O1 or EB1A driven where you you prepare most of it. Um, as many of you probably know, it is quite expensive. Um, I mean, you're, most lawyers between our fees and the government fees, you're going to be looking somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars to do an EB1A, um, just the I-140 part of it. Um, and so, I, I've been really trying to figure out a way to help more people because these cases do require a lot of, you know, the, the one-on-one -on -one, uh, aspect. We can only take on so many at a time. Um, most lawyers are probably going to be that way. Um, but what I the, the big takeaways just to kind of come back are, well, on that point, save some money so that if when you're ready, you've got the money set aside and allocated. I mean, think about what you spend money on all kinds of other things that you could not, you know, that you could do without. This is about your life and your family. So it should be worth setting aside twenty thousand dollars for. Um, so just put some money aside every month um, on the on the more practical side of it as well is keep keep good records of everything you're doing. Um, keep a log. Sundaria set up the, the tracker in Notion. So whether it's EB1A or O1A or even EB1B, use that to help you stay organized. It's, I mean, she's offering it for free, which is amazing. Um, and build your network. Network, network, network. Cause, and don't burn bridges because you just never know who you're going to need to ask for help or, or a favor. Um, those, those are probably my most practical pieces of advice I would give. That's awesome. Save money, 
Re keep records and network like your life depends on it. Yes. Thanks so much. <laughs> um yeah so as ron said he'll be at the launch party which is happening on july 22nd i'll talk to you all more about that but for now thank you so much again ron it was a pleasure hosting you thank I'll you to everyone and have a good day